Philippians chapter 3 this morning. Let's open to Philippians chapter 3. Uh, and after this, we've got a couple more messages out of Philippians. And then uh, on Abundance Sunday, the night we kick it off, that day I'm going to bring you an old message I preached a long time ago on abundance. And uh, it's a rehash, but I'll tell you what, it's such a good message, it has to be heard again. Because there's so much negative garbage out there, folks. I'm telling you what, the news, the world is just, you know, and as, it just leads me back to, back to Church Sunday. It's one of the reasons we need to invite people to church. There is no hope out there. There's no hope. Yeah, I mean, things are okay economically, you know, but even with things going well economically, and maybe your job has some, well, you might think it has some security to it, you know, things, things can look okay. We're still getting bombarded with a message of everything. The sky is falling. Terrible things are about to happen. We just don't know what they are, and they're coming our way. And boy, I want us to get out of that mentality again. I'm tired of it. I'm, I, just, I just feel like I've been filled up with it, and I need to get rid of it. So that's September 23rd in the morning, abundance. And then at night, we start abundance classes. Um, but again, tonight, today, we've got Philippians chapter 3. Uh, next week is Philippians chapter 4. And then on Back to Church Sunday, I'm going to finish Philippians. So chapter 3, and I want us to begin reading in verse 12. It says, not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, Paul says, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, forgetting what is behind, and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then, who are mature, should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you, only let us live up to what we've already obtained. Attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I've often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Father God, we thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would break through. God, that you would break through into our hearts and our minds. Lord, we know that your word will touch our spirits. God, I pray that you'd have your way in our life, Lord, as we, as we explore <clears throat> through this passage this morning. That we, be, that we be sensitive and aware of, of your anointing and your presence. Thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What a challenging, really, it's a challenging and encourage, encouraging passage that we just read. This is one of those reminder passages that I believe we need from, from every now and then, every so often, a word from the Lord that, that can help to recalibrate us and get us pointed once again in the right direction. You know, again, I, I, I love summers, and, and I think summers, summers can be routine for some people, but summertime can also be a time when, when you begin to kind of drift a little bit. You really do. You can get, you drift. You get, out of the, you get out of the habit of all the things you had to do. You know, the alarm clock may not come up as early as enough. You don't have to get the kids to bed at a certain time. You don't have to get them up real early. You know, and all the hubbub and all the extra curriculars after school and all the running here and there. And that's where summer becomes a little more restful for some people. But I think there can be other times of the year too when we can drift unintentionally. I really look at, I look at the Christian life as this constant need for readjustment, constant need for recalibration, and this passage fits the bill. I mean, for me, this passage is a reminder to get back on track. And so it's really fitting for today, for right now. I mean, if you consider these three paragraphs, Paul is writing to this church in Philippi, may have been one of his final letters. We do know that he was writing them from Rome, and he was incarcerated, he was in prison, in chapter 1, we were told that he was in chains. In chapter 2, we heard that his, 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 his good brother Epaphroditus had almost died in chapter 2. Possibly Epaphroditus had gotten ill. I mean, the prisons, prisons were deplorable back then. He may have been with Paul and contracted pneumonia or tuberculosis or some other dreadful disease. But at any rate, it appears in this chapter that with all of that in mind, Paul is being somewhat reflective. 
The Bible tells us that all scripture is God breathed. It's all inspired by God. And so in this chapter, Paul is speaking for God. God is speaking through Paul. He's writing this letter to the Philippian church. And now 2,000 years later, we're the beneficiaries. This same letter is now for us. God is speaking to us through the Apostle Paul. But here's my point. God's word to Paul, through Paul, became God's word to the Philippians. And now it is God's word for us. I want you to believe that. That this is God's word for us. And it's for today. God wants us to acknowledge what the Apostle Paul has shared with the Philippians way back when. And in the 12th verse, we see that Paul is reflecting on his life. Specifically, how that his conversion has brought about a, a completely new assessment of his goals. Everything changed when Paul was walking on that road to Damascus. When we become born again, as Paul, when we become born again, we get a new spirit. We get a new heart in the process, a new mind, and we suddenly begin to see things differently. And I love the way that Paul had described this transformation to the Corinthians. And this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 16. He said, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. He's talking about from the moment of salvation, the moment you received Christ, he says, from that moment on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, a new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now folks, listen, I, I put this message together a long time ago. I had it prepped a long time ago, not knowing that it would fall just weeks before back to church Sunday. Think about how this, this one passage out of Corinthians truly speaks to what we are supposed to be doing. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, verse 20, as though God were making his appeal through us. It's not as if he is making his appeal to people you know through you, or at least it's supposed to be that way. Amen? We implore you, therefore, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And, you know, no longer a worldly point of view as well. Verse 16 Verse 16, no longer a worldly point of view. No longer do we see things from a worldly and temporal and earthly perspective because as Paul tells us, the old has gone. It's been completely replaced by something brand new. It is as though we have been born anew. It's as though we have been born again, born a second time. And so you see, I believe that we need to, every one of us needs to absolutely take inventory of our lives every now and then. Now, this is a great message for, you know, the, the New Year's. That's when, that's when, you know, businesses like to take inventory at the beginning of the new year so they know what they have to pay tax on, inventory tax, etc. But I believe that we need to regularly make an assessment, take an inventory of our lives and our goals and make sure that they're on the right track. You know, when I think back to my own conversion experience, wasn't quite like the Apostle Paul's, or he was known as Saul of Tarsus at that time. But my own conversion experience was very drastic. It was very radical. It was like night and day. I went from drunkenness and debauchery to righteousness and salvation in one day. In fact, you know, really, in the time it took to say one simple prayer. One simple prayer. The sinner's prayer, we call it. My life was radically changed. It's like the Apostle Paul described my transformation when he wrote these words. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, he said, Of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. He called me out of darkness into his wonderful light. I mean, in a moment, in just, in Jesus' name, amen, prayer ended, everything changed in my life. Everything totally changed. Everything looked so different. I didn't realize it at first. I mean, there was a sense of lightness. I didn't realize. But, but the next day, suddenly I began to realize that 
Desires were gone. Desires that were there were gone. You see, before I went to that meeting and gave my life to Christ, my desire was to hit the bars. I never made it to the bar that night. Every morning prior to that one, I woke up and I would have at least a quart of beer. That would be breakfast. And then one about midday and one at lunch. A quart. And all of a sudden that next morning I woke up. What had been so routine for me, I'd done it for about a year and a half. It had become a habit, it had become so routine. It was suddenly gone, the desire wasn't there, I didn't give it a thought. Now I realized somewhere halfway through the day, my gosh, I, I don't care about alcohol anymore. My life was suddenly changed in just an instant. The moment that I became born again, my, by the Spirit, I suddenly became aware that I'd been living in a world that was upside down. I thought it was normal, but it was actually upside down where wrong was championed as right, where common sense was no longer com common, where basic wisdom was shunned for being too limiting. And that's the world we live in today, isn't it? And I didn't realize this until I read this one single verse out of, out of Acts chapter 17, verse 6. It's following a sermon by Paul and Silas in a Thessalonian synagogue. But after they preach, there's a riot that breaks out. And those early believers at that point, at that instant, were being accused. So the governmental authorities, they were, they, were, they, were telling, they were telling the governmental authorities, these men are turning the world upside down. Do you remember that scripture? Acts 17, 6. And of course, we know what the reality is. The apostles were actually writing the world. It was already upside down. But when you live in an upside down world and suddenly things go the other way, you assume that it's being turned upside down. And herein lies the problem and the very reason for every one of us needing to take an inventory of our lives this morning and to make sure that we, we have an assessment of our goals. We live in an upside down world. And those without Christ have only a skewed vision of reality, of what life can be. You know, for example, I mean, just think about marriage for a moment. Consider marriage for a moment. Christians are supposed to believe in being yoked to another person of like precious faith. Right? Paul talked about being equally yoked. Christians are supposed to marry Christians. We also profess in a belief that marriage is until death do us part. And we also are supposed to believe that marriage by definition can only be between a man and a woman. And yet, you know, sometimes I see people who give no concern. I'm talking about Christians too, for their religious or spiritual differences. I mean, Christians today tend to treat divorce like an option just as often as non-Christians, according to statistics I've read. It's, you know, it's, it's possible. The Supreme Court has rewritten the definition of marriage. We live in an upside down world. Hello? We live in an upside down world, folks. Where sin is not only tolerated today, it's exalted. It's flaunted. It's legalized. Because it's government sanctioned, and because it's government sanctioned, a lot of Christians want, they want to buy into it. They can, the government says, okay, it's not, it's not illegal. You know, really, we don't live in a state where pot, marijuana, has been legalized. But I really wonder what's going to happen to a lot of Christians once it is. So you're going to say, what does God think? I don't care what the government thinks. What does God think? And you know, today again, looking at the society around us, you know, commitment is no longer a quality of character. Integrity is nothing more than an expression of, of naivete, really. You see, when I became a Christian, there was a new way of thinking. I don't think in a worldly way anymore. I have to force myself to think in a worldly way when I listen to these talking heads and these TV commentators who are trying to give me their spin. I have to try to outthink them in my own mind just to maintain my sanity. So I have to, you know, to understand them, I've got to kind of go back a little bit to say, oh yeah, I could see that if I was a non-Christian. I'd, I'd think that way. And to think like a Christian oftentimes make you, make, makes you appear rather naive, doesn't it? But I'm telling you folks, because of this, we need to take a good hard look at our own lives. And we need to, we need to see if we've shifted in any of our personal values. Again, as Paul's exhorting us in this third chapter of Philippians, we need to take an assessment of our goals. Because frankly, our goals are going to influence our values. I believe that our goals are going to determine our convictions. 
Our goals are going to help us decide our priorities. So if heaven is important to me, then I'm going to do everything I can to get there. Does that make sense? If heaven's really important to me, I'm going to do what's necessary to get there and to get others to go there with me. If, it's really, if I really believe that heaven's important, that I want to live in heaven the rest of my life and I want my friends and family to live in heaven all eternity, then I need to do what's necessary to get them there. If pleasing God is important to me, if that's my goal, then my actions should reflect that goal. And I'm going to live in such a way then with standards that truly please God. If I want to please God, I've got to live in a way that pleases Him. So again, as I mentioned in my very first message from this Philippian letter, the main overall theme of this book is that there's always room for improvement. So don't, don't take this as a scolding this morning. I know a lot of us are doing a great job. Really, a lot of us are doing a great job. But there's always more. Really, there's always more. Until, until Jesus comes again, until we hear that it's done and it's over and he's coming and time is no more, we've got some work to do. And so regardless of what chapter or verse you might read in this study, there's always room for improvement. That's the overarching theme of this entire letter. <clears throat> and so what Paul would tell us is this. As much as everything changes when a person's first saved and born again, I mean, not all of us had that radical conversion experience, but I mean, I can relate to it. Several, many of you can, I'm sure. But beyond that major initial readjustment, I believe there have to be little corrections every now and then, don't you? There have to be some more recalibrations. Can you see that? You know, when you're first born of the Spirit, there may have been drastic and radical adjustments, truly life-changing, as I expressed to you about my own life, but that process is meant to be continual. I don't think it's a once and for all. You're saved once, you know, and then you, you work out your salvation according to Scripture. Paul mentioned that to the Philippians in the first chapter 6 verse. He said, be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You know, when I, again, the Bible says to work out your salvation. We're not saved by works. That's not what it means. But we are to be in cooperation with him. We're to allow him, as this, I'm going to read it again, being confident of this, that he who began a good work on you the day you got saved will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That's what it's talking about. He's going to continue to work in you if you'll let him, if you'll cooperate with him. And God is desirous of continually working in us. Conforming us into the image of his son and our Lord Jesus Christ. And although all of our prior achievements and accomplishments are wonderful. They're all wonderful. You can look back at things God has done through your life. Praise God. Those are monumental. Those are great. And although he may have done great things in your past. May have used you in some powerful and wonderful ways. You know what Paul said in this chapter as we read it? He said, forget it. Forget it all. Forget where you were. Even yesterday. And strain toward what is ahead. That's, that's really the importance of this message this morning. Pressing on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. That's the word of God. Folks, we're meant to live our Christian life on purpose, with intention. We're not to kick it into neutral. We're not meant to coast through this life. We're to be deliberate in our Christian living. You and I are members of God's kingdom. And Jesus said this about his kingdom. And I love this passage. Just one simple verse. Matthew 11, verse 12. Jesus said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. The kingdom of God is never wimpy. The kingdom of God is never slack. It's always active. It's always advancing. It is forceful. As Jesus told us, it's forceful. And forceful men and women and boys and girls grab hold of it. And folks, if you know me at all, I do, I, I, I do not like to do anything halfway. I like to commit. I like to do things God's way so that I can enjoy the full blessings. Not some, but the full blessings and the abundance that comes through obedience. Or as Paul put it, and we just read it, Philippians 3.14, to press on toward the goal to win the prize. I want victory in my life all the time. I don't like losing. 
I don't like being defeated. I don't like failure. I'm just, I'm just curious. I've got, I've got a little quote I'm going to share in, in just a second here, but I'm just, you know, the crowds are changing. You know, um, the older generation is getting older and we've got a lot more younger generation, but show of hands. How many remember the name Vince Lombardi? That's like ancient history now. I got to quote him. I got to quote him because this is, he said, winning isn't everything. Winning is the only thing. And football season's just about upon us. I mean, this preseason means nothing. The real players aren't even playing hardly. But, but I thank God that our encouragement and our drive and direction doesn't come from football coaches. As bold as that statement is, winning isn't everything. Winning is the only thing. Our encouragement comes from great members of God's great hall of faith in the book of Hebrews. I mean, like the Apostle Paul. What a, what a great mentor for every one of us. Because you see, he too was obsessed with victory. Paul was obsessed with victory. I want you to look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Paul says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. I mean, he keeps mentioning prize. Isn't it interesting that he mentions that word? Prize. And he mentions training. And competing and winning and straining and striving and pressing on in the book of, in, in, in the letter of the Philippians. They're all deliberate action words, folks. There's nothing complacent, there's nothing docile about these verbs. But understand, to win requires training and planning and strategy. He said in 1 Corinthians 9 25, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. If you're gonna compete, you're gonna train. Common sense, isn't it? So let me ask you. What training is taking place in your life? What training is taking... You guys did nothing yesterday. I did nothing yesterday. It's like, it was a break from training though, wasn't it? It was a break from training. It's kind of interesting how that fit. What training is taking place in your life? I want you to ask yourself that. This is a time for reassessment today based on where we are in the letter to the Philippians. What deliberate spiritual training events and exercise are part of your routine? You understand what I'm saying? What is part of your life that is strengthening you spiritually? Paul told Timothy, bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness has value for all things. Godliness has value for all things. So, do you study the Bible by attending a weekly group Bible study? Let me just go through a little checklist with you. Do you attend a weekly? You know, we have a Wednesday night one here. You might have another one you can go to during the day. I don't know. But is there a weekly Bible study group where people come together and share and study the Word? Do you put yourself into any venue whereby you can learn something new? Gain a little more wisdom and knowledge from God's word? Find some application? Do you intentionally do the things that will facilitate spiritual growth in your life? A couple hours ago, 9 a.m. here at church, every Sunday, our life groups, we used to call them Sunday school classes. It's a great, it's a great place to get plugged in on Sunday mornings. We have a class for every age group. From birth to at least 102 years old. Our oldest uh, former participant was 102. So if you're 102, you're welcome to come. And you know, I've said this before, and it's not original to me, but in the Assemblies of God, our church members never graduate from Christian education. You never graduate from growing and learning more about the Bible because no one should ever stop learning about the Bible. Amen? And now in just less than a month, we're going to dive into abundance again on Sunday evenings. You're going to have the opportunity to choose. You can, you can learn about financial peace. You can learn how to eat and live more healthfully. 
how to do well with single parenting, and, and there are going to be a couple other adult studies, never mind what we have for the youth. We've got some exciting things for the youth group. We've got great things that Miss Lucy's planning for the children. And so here's what we need to do. Look, look again at Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 through 20. Paul says, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. That's the world we live in, folks. Their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, you've been born again. You've entered into new life. It's a new life in Christ. But where, where really, right this moment, is your heart and your mind? Paul said their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. Now, in the next week or two, in the fourth chapter, Paul will tell us what things to think about. And he also, he also mentioned this in Colossians chapter 3. He wrote, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And that's timely advice. And so the question for each one of us today is really simple. Where is our heart today? Where is our mind are we involved in spiritual training? Yeah, I find this message very apropos for today. I mean, some of our kids have gone back to college, to university. Most students have gone back to school locally or will go back to school very quickly. This would be a great time to decide to get back into some form of spiritual training when it's offered here at Praise. As well as, you know, your own Bible reading time and talking to God. Is our, heart, is our heart set on earthly things or focused on spiritual things? Spiritual growth. Because folks, there's always room for improvement. That's the theme of Philippians. There's always room for improvement. And there's a need to press on to strive forward.